pass on the couple mm -hmm. um, because some of them were, you know, very, very old builds. So, so I'm actually noticing that Austin has a lot more um, amenities than compared to some of the other places. So I've seen EV charging stations. I've sure. seen um, car wash stations in, in the parking, in the parking lots, which, you know, I don't think we ever have those in the Dallas area. Maybe we just don't have as much space, but right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah I, yeah, you know, keep Austin weird. That's, that was the whole thing, right? That is the thing. <laughs> so, right. And then, so um, I'm going to um, the Old Capital Conference later this month. Gotcha. Yeah, I'll be at the Real Estate Guys one later this month as well. Oh yeah, where, where is it at? It's at Dallas. Yeah. Oh, it's at Dallas also. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and then I need to visit anyways because we're still. So right now we're in the marketing period for the apartment that we're selling. Mm. Um, so yeah. Hopefully everything goes well. We should have it closed by uh, end of the year. Yeah, it's a little Christmas <laughs> present for yourself. That's nice. Uh, anyone else buying anything? Uh, I see Alex Chan. You got a you got a picture. Uh, so I'm gonna call on you. Where where you're from? What are you up to? Alex, Alex Chan. All right, no answer. Um, Ricky Tran. Uh, Ricky Tran, where are you from? What are you uh, doing? Sorry, I'm, I missed it. Can you repeat that? <laughs> uh, no worries. Uh, where are you from? What are you doing? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm based in SF. Um, currently at the office I work right now, but I'm looking for my first property, hopefully in uh, Columbus by end of year. Oh, um, okay. Or, or somewhere, um, but anywhere outside of California, probably. Have you tried <laughs> to talk to Julie Tam? She uh, just bought her first, uh, I think, it was a duplex. I don't know if it's a duplex, but she just bought a house out there as well. So that was her first one. Uh, you should reach out to her, Julie T A M. Let me just text her name here for you. Uh, you can ask her experience because um, this is also her first purchase. So I think she's also oh, nice. an area person. So. And Ricky, you're in San Fran. You, you know we have a meetup next week, right? When Clay. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm actually going to go. Um, I guess I have to go now, now that I've mentioned it on this. Yeah, uh, we this have. Call. Well, also, this is recorded. And yeah. so I'm going to hold you <laughs> to <evidence>. it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And obviously, from my background, you can see I'm also from the city. So I will drag you there if I have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, um, Regina Pham, what are you up to? Hello. Good to meet you. Uh, what are you looking to do at the moment? How can we help you out? Oh, hi. Hey. Just joining, I was interested in doing commercial, investing in commercial. I'm okay. currently just investing just one or two, and I'm actually traveling out of state to see the potential market. I probably won't get in anytime soon because I'm not sure how the market's going to be. Yeah, wow. but I love to learn from you guys. A lot of you guys are very, uh, you guys are, you know, open minded and willing to share your experience. So that's a, a gift. Yeah, so I'm, I'm great to be joining you guys. Well, you know the saying, you can't attend the market. Uh, so yes. uh, I I think it also go down, but I'm actually probably going to keep buying. So, you know, yeah, some it, people. Yeah, long-term like, wise, is, yes, long-term wise, I believe is, is a good investment. So, yes. Well, that's it for me. <laughs> uh, let's see. Kong, are you buying anything new? uh any new purchases on the horizon for you uh yeah in contract with another single home but again try to graduate from single home uh, <laughs> um still you know haven't graduated yet from single home so <laughs> is it in uh, phoenix again no it's in the backyard here in california um <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, I'm just trying to test out new ideas and stuff and try to make the number work. So, you know, everyone just hate California and me too, but uh, try to figure out if still make it work, uh, mainly for other folks to follow. Because some, some of the, yeah, invest, uh, young folks, um, 
you know, in, in, in my circle, they, uh, they really afraid of investing out of states. And they keep asking me, where should I buy in California? I was like, yeah, there's nowhere to buy unless you, you gotta do some tricks. And um, they ask what tricks? And then that's what I'm trying to figure out <laughs> with my own money. <laughs> yeah, I mean, technically you could buy like out in Fresno, but if that's like a six hour drive for you, you might as well then, or I don't know Fresno, but like- uh, No, we're, no, we're, yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I have one in Fresno. It's two and a half hours for me. Not too yeah, bad. Might as well go out of state though. If that's two and a half hours away, right? Right, but uh, they just feel like California, you know. It's like I, I was like, hop on an airplane, you can get anywhere within three, four hours, and a lot of uh, you you expand a lot of opportunities. But they just afraid the work out of states. That definitely makes sense. Okay, with that, we're gonna get started real quick. Uh, we hit the. We hit the 705 mark. I want to give a <laughs> warm intro to Tony Lin. Uh, he's a commercial apartment investor. Um, and he does multifamily self-storage and construction projects across the U.S. and China. Uh, he's based in Silicon Valley, where he's a techie software engineer, like many of you. Um, he's invested in over about 3,500 uh, multifamily units and sponsors another 500 himself, where he's you know the, the one running it. Um, and so Tony is pretty passionate about sharing his knowledge and uh, he holds pretty regular meetups, uh, which he'll plug uh, real quick. The Silicon Valley um, multifamily uh, group. I, I can't oh, remember. Put exactly. it in the chat. <laughs> yeah, put it in the chat. Uh, if you guys are interested, uh, you know, feel free to follow up with him or go to those events. Um, so without further ado, Tony, can you sort of tell us how you got started um, in real estate? Sure. So, you know, uh, my background is a software engineer. So, um, you know, I was actually fortunate enough to be with a couple of, co I mean, I'm a small company kind of guy. Uh, I think I can tolerate up to 800 people in a company, but once it crosses that point, I look for something smaller to, um, you know, go for the startup experience again. So um, I was fortunate enough to be in a couple of startups that actually went public. Um, so I was looking for a place to invest those funds, right? Um, first, I invested in um, China, uh, in the housing market there. It was really, really good, but really, really crazy. I mean, the policy changes so much that, you know, uh, it, my, my stomach turns just when I think about how fast the policy changes. So, <clears throat> yeah, so I was actually looking for something I can invest in, um, gain experience, but without having to um, physically contribute a lot of time to it, right? And that's where um, I learned about passive investing. Uh, California wasn't gonna work. Um, it's just, you know, you can't get anywhere close to the 1% rule, right? So, um, but Texas fits the bill. Um, so that's when I learned about um, apartments, right? So um, I met a couple from Hong Kong. They basically, you know, were taking advantage of the pricing and um, they bought up to 70, 72 single family homes in Dallas alone. Okay, so, and they were managing it all by themselves. Um, so that was a lot of tax returns. That was a lot of, um, you know, documents to go through. So, and then they kind of figured it out. It's like, ah, instead of managing that many single family homes, why don't I just manage one hundred unit apartment? And that's one thing I can. That's only one thing I had to take care of, right? So. I listened to that. I thought it was a pretty good idea. So I was able to passively invest into these deals um, where they um, were the sponsors, they lead the deal, they handle the day-to-day -day management, and I can continue to do my um, passive, uh, my um, everyday job, right? So yeah, and that's why, you know, it allowed me to scale up into this um, larger uh, commercial multifamily. Actually, yeah, that's really interesting because uh, now everyone's trying to get into the like single family large portfolio space, at least the hedge funds are. So um, they, they've, I don't know, maybe it's changed, but nowadays there's a lot of software that makes it easier to file those tax returns and, yeah. uh, you know, group all the properties together, including insurance and, you know, uh, your, your, uh, your taxes. So that, that I think is kind of funny that it's changed so much recently. So, uh, but that's cool. What made you confident enough to start investing yourself and running the sponsorships uh, in these apartment complexes? Because that's also another leap, right? 
Right. So I think, you know, I just found it really interesting um, to be out of the office and actually be kind of hands on. So um, I was lucky enough that um, the first the first uh, the first syndication group that I met, who was actually also local in the Bay Area. Um, you know, so I, I basically approached him and said that, hey, you know, I know you guys just bought a property. I'm going to go invest in it. Can I go do the due diligence with you guys? Right. So I hopped on the plane, flew with them, um, walked all the units with them, um, also did the comps with the other apartments in the area, pretending like I'm a person that's about to move in. And, um, you know, basically just walk through the whole purchase process with them. And after the deal closed, um, I joined, the, I was able to join the weekly calls and basically just listen in on everything that was actually going on. Um, what are all the bad things that can happen in apartments? What are all the gotchas, right? Um, so through that experience and um, going to meetups and conferences regularly, I learned more and more. I was able to build my team and um, because I invested in about eight different apartment deals at that time, I was able to see a pretty wide scope of the different operations and the different things that happened. So um, I, I then you know, was hosting a meetup to kind of share all the little things that I have learned along the way. Um, and that introduced me to a lot of potential um, investors who want to also, uh, who wants to invest in apartments, but didn't really know how. So. Um, through that, uh, you know, we, we got a nice club going. And um, so, yeah, that's how we were able to pour our money together and uh, find deals together. Got it. That makes sense. Okay. So um, looking back, what do you feel like was one of the biggest mistakes you made that you would like to warn people of, especially <laughs> if they're trying to transition to the commercial space, just like you did? Right. So um, probably not directly from me, but I think one of the biggest mistake that I've seen people have gone through that um, I was lucky that I was advised to avoid is don't try to go too small. Um, so there's a lot of, um, so my partners have started out by buying 20 unit deals, 30 unit deals. And what they found is when the units are too small, you can't really afford professional management, right? So ends up you know, you, it's a lot of work because you're, you're basically having to run it yourself a lot of times. And um, you're usually asking somebody on site to handle the money for you or handle maintenance issue for you. And that's fraught with danger, right? So um, usually, you know, I think my recommendation is try to see if you can find partners and, um, you know, or partner with somebody who's experienced. This way you can scale up to at least 60 units, which is good um, to, as a good place to start. Instead of trying to um, go through the pains of, you know, going through 20, 40, which is actually higher risk than partnering up with somebody to do a 60 or 70 unit deal. Yeah. And, and you know, I think one of the, one of the thing is, um, I, I mean, so we have a lot of friends who want to jump into the deals, but they just, they didn't know enough uh, to start. And uh, so they very quickly tried to go buy something, um, but didn't have enough of a backup support. Um, and they were not able to close a deal or they were not able to raise the financing that they did. Um, unfortunately, that means that you kind of get into this, um, you know, uh, do not playlist on the broker side. So um, usually make sure that you have somebody to back you up, you know, just uh, people who have done it before and um, it, it really helps. I was lucky to be mentored by one of my friends and um, that's why I feel like, you know, um, I, if I can help anybody, I, I, I want to because, yeah. Don't forget, um, you also lose all the earnest money. Uh, so on a seven uh, seven million dollar property that can end up being, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars. That's just when you can't close on it. So, um, exactly. but yeah, uh, how how small would you say is too small? And then um, how did you go about finding a mentor like that if they aren't your friend already? <laughs> so um, I think anything below. I mean, I think like. Um, that really tough range to operate in is 15 to 30. Um, anything a little bit larger, you can kind of hire a part-time uh, manager that can be shared with another property 
but um, yeah, 15 to 30, you know, the numbers is, is, you know, you can only afford to have the manager for one day out of a week and that just doesn't really work, right? Um, you, you're pretty much self-managing at that point. So, uh, and your goal is really to become as passive as possible. <laughs> Free yourself up so you can do other stuff. Um, in terms of mentors, I think it is really about um, finding, you know, joining enough, going to enough meetups, meeting enough syndicators and just knowing what are the qualities to look for, right? Uh, usually um, people will be happy to take you on if there's something that you can bring to the table, right? So uh, the syndicator's job usually is to go out and look for deals. So um, they may need help setting up their website. They may need help with investor relations. Um, they may need help running the numbers, right? Because um, sometimes to analyze the, the one year of profit and loss, analyze the rent roll, coming out with a quick analysis, you know, can take about an hour to two hours, right? When you're looking at maybe 30 to 40 deals in the pipeline, that could take a long time. So if you can help somebody, if they can teach you how to analyze this, and then if you can help them do this preliminary analysis, that's great value in my opinion. Yeah, underwriting should take me uh, about a day when I first started. And you know, you're right, it's like, it narrows down to about an hour of property at this point. So right. uh, no, that definitely makes sense. Okay, question. You, you still work your W-2, right? How do you balance do. the two, <laughs> right? How does that work? Yeah, so um, I think you just have to learn to be really efficient with your time. So um, I'm kind of lucky being a software engineer, um, our times are pretty flexible. Um, as long as you get your job done by a certain date, um, it really doesn't matter how you spend your hours. Um, so I used to have an hour and a half commute um, going to Mountain View every day. So during, um, so during that time, I would put my Tesla into autopilot and now I'm free to, <laughs> I'm free to make all the phone calls to the brokers, to my property, to uh, investors. So um, that, that hour and a half to, to work and hour back is when I actually make a lot of use of my time. Um, and also I, I listen to podcasts. I listen to these live streams like, um, <clears throat> like you're hosting. So you also gain a lot of real, real world knowledge from there, right? And um, so, you know, after putting the kid to sleep um, from 10 o'clock to whenever, then um, that's my time. Um, so I usually spend about, a couple hours a day, you know, maybe one hour to two hours to manage the property that I own, and then another hour to two to look for new opportunities to evaluate. So, um, yeah, I mean, once you, once you kind of plan out and be as efficient as you can, it works out pretty well. Okay, and then, so the next part is, how do you go about then, um, I guess, deciding at what point can you leave your job and at what point are you going to keep doing real estate uh, <laughs> that you have to pick even i'm at that stage right now <laughs> so i think um so i think you know i've done enough um active transactions that if i get another my plan is if i acquire another two properties uh within this year um then i will be quitting my full-time job uh and concentrate on the real estate full-time so Right now, um, it's at a point where I'm, I mean, I'm able to manage probably two, two to three properties while holding my work, right? But um, future down the expansions, I would say that to run, a pro run properties really well, uh, you're a, one person is able to run two properties really well. So um, I'll be scaling with partners. Um, I will be scaling with maybe even finding full-time staff to help uh, run some of the stuff. Um, but yeah, I do plan that within another one or two apartments, depending on the size, um, that would be time for me to retire early <laughs> and switch to you know, a much more exciting job of yeah, running multifamily. All right, um, with that, that kind of uh, is, I think the main structure questions. Uh, last one I wanna ask is, how do you feel like being Asian has affected you in, the, in like the real estate space or does it at all? Um, so at first I thought there would be a large impact, but later I realized it doesn't really have a large impact. Um, so, um, you know, Texas being a very 
red state. But however, once you when you talk to the brokers, uh, when you talk to other people inside the circle, they're so used to working with Asian investors that there's no, you know, there's nothing that would ever impede it, right? Um, on the other hand, um, Asian investors are usually um, very easy to talk to. Okay, so um, the main thing about Asians is all about trust, right? So if you're able to explain what you're doing very well, if you can show a good track record, even if it was just passive experience, um, people trust you and then they stay with you uh, a long time, right? So uh, if anything, I think being an Asian was actually a real advantage. Um, we're, we're able, we're able, we, we have a huge circle of people who are really interested in real estate. So there's no shortage of funding. Yeah. And we all have cash and <laughs> we all, we all like real estate. So definitely two perks to that. Um, okay. Uh, I'll start going through the questions we've asked now. All right. Uh, Ivan uh, Sasan asked from startup background to multifamily syndication, what do startup founders, innovators, and employees find most attractive about partnering up with capital raisers slash sponsors? Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Well, sorry. What, basically, what do startup founders, innovators uh, find most attractive about partnering up with capital raisers slash sponsors? Like, is there something about capital raisers that make them more attractive one versus another? Yeah. So I think, you know, um, people love to partner with somebody who has ability to raise capital because, you know, um, it is it really alleviates a large part of um, of the work you know, uh, being an active sponsor, right? But, <clears throat> but at the same time, you know, um, it's, it's all about, yeah, so it's, it's all about that startup feeling, right? Being able to do hands-on, being able to do the things yourself. And um, yeah, so I like being hands-on and that's why, you know, I think uh, this, this, this job description fits me much better. Uh, so job search fits you better. Does that mean you weren't that interested in the past um, in, in real estate? Or was it just like you, you did software because the money was there and then you're using this as a way to build up your business? Is that what you yeah. mean? So, right. So um, it's always easier if you have some initial funding um, to do deals, right? But you can always start up slow as well. You don't, it's not, you don't always need a large capital. So for example, there are deals like, you know, even for $50,000, you can invest with somebody and you can learn so much just from that, right? Um, and then if you don't have capital of your own, that's okay, right? So um, you can partner with somebody who's able to bring in the capital while you bring in the sweat equity, right? So I can handle the operations, I can handle the day-to-day -day planning and, um, you know, calling all the contractors, calling all the vendors, arranging for things to uh, be done, right? So um, usually in a partnership, people have very defined roles. Um, like one person will be handling operations, one person will be investors. Um, another one is just kind of, you know, like the tech guy that kind of ties everything together, right? So um, yeah, everybody have their own contributions, so. I'm currently the tech guy for the stuff, for the time. <laughs> and that's super valuable because you, you make everything so efficient in terms of like searching for deals. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of direct messaging at the moment. Okay. Um, well, you didn't not uh, mention that the autopilot uh, ROI is insane. Uh, could you maybe go over some of the books? Um, like how, what in particular did you do that, I guess, took you um, from each hour a day to you know, learning as quickly as you did? Yeah, so um, I was able to get some fundamentals uh, in certain, uh, by attending some small classes. Um, there's a lot of mentorship programs out there, um, you know, that they're gonna charge you like $25,000 just to join the program. You don't need to do that, um, you know, but they do offer, uh, sometimes they offer like a two day special um, where for like 400 bucks, 500 bucks, there's like a two day crash course to teach you everything there, I mean, to, to teach you the basics. And at the end, ask you to sign up for this $25,000 thing, right? Take the crash course, don't sign up for a 25,000 thing and go to meetups. Um, that sets a really good foundation. So 
also, you know, I get this request a lot to, you know, learn more about multifamily by doing um, hands-on. So I was actually thinking of starting like a small club here where, because, you know, you know what I do during the weekends? I actually go and look at apartments. Not once I'm going to buy, but the ones in your, in your neighborhood. So when you walk enough apartments, you can identify roof uh, sewer issues. You can identify, um, you know, renovation levels. You can identify like uh, different amenities that you can add really quickly. Okay, so I walked at least forty apartments in the Bay Area, and um, I can tell you right now, oh, this roof, you know, it's not sparkly anymore. It's due, or this sewer outage, you know, hey, there's like white powder around it. That means there were actually some sewer backup, and they use a white powder to try to clean up the smell. So see if you can find any meetup group in your area that's willing to go on these outings and you can learn a lot just from like real life experiences. Yeah, if anyone's an awesome one, DM me. I do this all the time. Uh, I actually started it because I had a mentor who was a contractor. And so he's the one who took me around and showed me what was wrong with all the properties I wanted to buy. Um, <laughs> so yeah, no, I, a lot of walkthroughs definitely help. You know, uh, the math starts changing once you get bigger um but only slightly you know but uh I, I have a pretty good ballpark in terms of a lot of single family homes that aren't in california or new york i can pretty much estimate pretty closely uh, yeah and that's a and that's a super valuable skill to have because you know when we go tour certain apartments right you're really only given half an hour you know to look at the units so um, usually I bring my property management team along, but when I don't have them alone, you, you need the ability to very gauge what are the million dollar capital items that I have to spend. Right. So, yeah. All right. Yick Lam asked, uh, what if you do that, do you feel like you're disrespecting your computer science background? Uh, I guess, uh, it was talking about quitting your job and trying to go over. Yeah. How do you feel about leaving, you know, computer science behind after you've been doing it for so long? I mean, it's a bittersweet. I mean, the thing is, I, I, I stayed as a software engineer because I enjoy building so much. Um, that's why, otherwise I would have quit much earlier. Um, but at the same time, um, I, I'm actually applying a lot of my programming towards this, right? So um, I'm also writing a software to help me analyzing the, uh, the monthly spend to basically raise flags on any uh, extraordinary utility or um, you know, expenses that should be looked at. And um, I'm able to also write up software to help me underwrite deals and to automate all these things, right? So um, to make the whole process easier. So I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not quitting software per se, but changing into a different form. Uh, let's see. Um... Question from why well, you didn't not a I am a software engineer. What value add can I provide to probable mentors to gain experience slash mentorship? Uh, yeah, so exactly that. So I think one of the most valuable thing is the ability to, and and I think that really helps somebody new is ability to underwrite a deal, right? So um, typically when we look at a deal, we want to see the last one year performance. And we also want to look at the rent roll to see like what percentage of people have just moved in the last one month or two, right? Because a seller is trying to stuff it to make it look good, but it's all fake. Um, so if you're able to write your own software, um, which is not hard, you're really just parsing Excel spreadsheets, right? And, um, you know, and that you'll learn in the process and you'll also make, um, you'll bring a lot of value to somebody who doesn't have these tools, right? You'll speed up the time. Okay, Ivan uh, asked, uh, thanks for your response. Follow up, why would startup people want to invest in commercial syndications passively? Um, so, you know, as in startups, you're super busy, right? So um, in my past startups, I'm probably working 12 to 15 hours a day. So during this time, you really don't have time to look for deals yourself, run deals yourself, uh, all that kind of stuff, right? So that's why starting out passively, where you um, put your money with them um, allows you to concentrate on what you do best in your startup, right? And instead of paying somebody to get the education, you're literally now getting paid to get experience. So 
um, you're working and you're also watching how these deals are being run, what are the different gotchas while making cash flow and appreciation. And what's better than that? Makes sense. Um, okay. Alex Chen asked, hey, Tony, are your deals 506B or 506C? I can explain this for everyone curious. 506B means you take in non-accredited investors. 506C means you take in only accredited. And then on that, also, can you explain how your syndication is unique compared to other syndicators? Yeah. So um, 506B is, um, like you mentioned, um, can only have people who are accredited, which basically means your net worth is at least a million dollars. Uh, excluding your primary residence, right? So um, because my network of investors, um, a lot of them are actually qualified as accredited, this gives me a lot of flexibility. So I can take in people who are not accredited as well. So most of my deals run at 506B. So 506C, you can only take in accredited people, but then you get to advertise, right? So um, for if you want to build up your investor list quickly, you might go 506 C. Um, but because I guess because of my deals not only, you know, it, it's also a way for my friends who don't really understand apartments to be able to join and make money on the apartments together. Uh, and they're not all accredited. So 506 B works out really well for me. Yeah, same thing. Uh, I kind of started to help my friends out in the Bay and also family get involved in the deals. Um, so uh, it, 506B allows you to like bring in people, you know, friends and family who don't uh, qualify for accredited status, which is a million dollars in net worth, not counting your primary home or 200K annually in income. Uh, so, uh, okay. Have you ever considered productionizing your scripts like prop tech? I can actually answer this. Um, a lot of scripts I've built, I realized someone else has already done it and they charge like a thousand dollars a month. And so it's like, I can build a tech startup, but I'm already building another real estate company. And it's like, well, do you want to build a tech startup or do you want to build a real estate company? And if you do build the tech startup, you have to charge a lot of money to people, at which point you become just as expensive as all the other prop tech companies doing the same thing. By the way, I think Nelson has actually really advanced scripts for scraping for deals, for looking at the listings. So, um, and, and it's really amazing. And that's exactly the kind of value add. I mean, I think Nelson taking it to the next level, of course, but <clears throat> you know, it's a kind of value add that you add, but when you start selling it, then you feel responsible and then you're going to have to maintain and fix bugs. And that actually becomes more of your full-time job than what you're actually using it for so <laughs> it's a you know it's a pick and choose yeah i actually just helped somebody like scrape um uh, a list of like seven different markets for multifamily uh, and their owners and skip trace them uh, because i already had the script but it took me like a week because i kept and uh, the script crashes occasionally so i have to like re-up it and then there's like software updates and so it's like if i was a legitimate company that would be my full-time job but this is a favor so i could <laughs> take a whole week to get them this data that they wanted you know, yeah so well i'm gonna ask you for that favor as well <laughs> so. what was the timeline uh, kong asked what was the timeline slash time period uh, when you started aka from when you started investing in syndications uh, to buying uh, your own stuff yeah um i think it actually went pretty fast for me so um, after, so within the first year, um, I invested in about six different deals, um, because I also leveraged my, my, um, uh, retirement funds to invest in deals, right? So it wasn't all cash. Um, so with your, with your rollover IRA funds, for example, you can convert that to something. You can also use that fund to reinvest in syndications. So. Yeah. It's called a yeah. self-directed IRA. Um, I think we have some people, if you're curious, you can reach out. I, I know some people who can help you create one and then it allows you to invest in other people's um, projects like syndications and then make money from it taxlessly. Exactly, yeah. So um, after a year of um, investing passively, um, that's when I was able to find a partner that share similar interest and you know started looking at deals right and it would i would say it would take at least a year to not screw things up dramatically 
um, have um, have a property management company that will um, you know work with you, have a lender that knows like okay what kind of loan can get you all that kind of stuff. So um, within about a year, you know, uh, you should be able to start looking for deals. And um, so I I first um, KP'd on the deal, key principal on the deal, um, within about a year or so. So KP is where you kind of sign on as a loan guarantor on one of the deals. But the nice thing about it is now you have a track record with Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, right? So that makes it easy to get loans on your own in the future. So after about one year, that's when we started looking for deals. Um, on the second year, that's where we landed our first property, 146 units. Um, so yeah, and things went pretty fast on there. Um, so this, uh, I'll throw an overarching question on this next one. Um, what was your first multifamily deal like? How long did it take to acquire it? What was the process? Could you break it down for us? Sure. So um, I would say in Dallas, uh, in our price range, any given month, there's probably three to four deals, right? Um, so uh, we we found this we, we found this one through um, a network connection of mine. And um, so it was, uh, so from it usually, once you have uh, found a property, there's usually a one month marketing period at the end of which there's a bidding process, right? So bidding process usually takes about two weeks. You have your best and final, you know, you have your um, buyer uh, seller interview, and then they settle on the final buyer, right? Um, and usually after that, it's two months to close. And then that was an easy part. <laughs> and then you operated for the next five to six years. <laughs> That's a much longer part. So, yeah. Um, and then how has that multifamily project actually gone? Uh, when, did, uh, when was this purchase? And then, um, you know, in terms of like the plan, like um, what was the plan for it? And where are you at in that plan? No. Nah. In, funny that you ask because um, so this first project that we acquired was about three years ago. Um, so we bought that for about 11, close to $12 million. And we're actually selling it right now. <laughs> it's on the market right now. So um, our original plan was to hold it for five to six years uh, where we hope that we can um, double everybody's money within that time, right? So we, we hit that benchmark in three years. So we're, we're selling the property uh, right now. So we bought it for about 11.7. Um, I think right now it'll comfortably go above 17 million. Yeah. Can you, uh, Chloe Kwan asks, can you talk more about your self-storage experiences, financing, stabilizing, marketing mistakes, uh, or was that something you invested in as an LP? Yeah, so um, the self-storage, I was actually an LP, um, but this was a mix of new construction as well as self-storage. So self-storage is also, uh, I'm a pretty conservative investor, so I like, I like um, deals that do well in a downturn. Um, and self-storage is one of those things where when people lose their home, they have to park all their extra belongings somewhere. So self-storage actually does really well during downturns. Um, so this deal was in Milwaukee, um, where they took over a historic building. Um, so, and they converted a historical building into an air conditioned um, self storage tower. Um, so complete with the freight elevators and everything. So this was nice because usually self storage pays anywhere from eight to 10% um, fixed. Um, it's pretty steady. There's nothing to improve, but at the same time, there's nothing, there's no toilets that you need to unclog. So, um, but this one uh, with a new construction piece of it, um, the overall return actually goes up closer to 20%, right? Um, because it doesn't cost that much money to build self-storage units. They, they actually roll out this big old ply of um, roll of metal sheeting. So they basically set up four corners, wrap the metal sheeting around it. There you go, you have a storage unit. <laughs> it's, it's actually very, very inexpensive to set up. Um, I think the second question was, uh, were there any mistakes in financing? Um, I think that's one of the biggest lessons learned as well. Um, back in the old days, you know, uh, we always advocated for a long-term debt 
Fannie Mae 12 year, 10 year debt, right? Uh, where we lock in the rate, which was historic low at the time. However, um, the drawback for that is if your property does so well that you had to sell within three years or two years or three years, um, you could end up with a large prepayment penalty. Yeah, so um, nowadays people are gravitating towards um, bridge, bridge loans or um, basically floater rates. Um, the nice thing about these rates is that there's only a 1% prepayment penalty, right? Whereas if you, had you gone for like a 12 year fixed loan, the prepayment penalty could be as much as like 32%. Sorry, I think you're still on mute, Nelson. Oops, okay, uh, I was checking the Facebook page. Okay, so that was kind of, uh, I think the last question. I double checked the Facebook. I think that's kind of it for today. Uh, does anyone have any final questions we have for Tony at the moment? Uh, do you have any new projects you wanna talk about? Uh, things you wanna uh, chat uh, as we wrap up or, oh, Arthur asked a question. Where are you acquiring now? What's your deal funnel look like? Yeah, so right now we're still focusing on the state of Texas. Um, so that's where we have the most network connections and um, that's where we have our teams built. Uh, we're also looking to expand into Salt Lake City as well as Indiana uh, and maybe even North Carolina. So these are, you know, we primarily focus on population growth um, cities um, because that's how you get your rent growth, right? Um, the B and C supplies are fairly restricted. You know, they're not really building anymore. So if you have a large population influx, um, the B and C tends to do really well in terms of rent growth there. So, um, yeah, so currently, you know, I think we're looking at anywhere from 10 to 20 deals a month um, that may funnel down to like, you know, really two deals worth investigating and uh, maybe one or two deals that were really worth pursuing. Your, your deal funnel is a little bigger than mine then. Uh, we're, uh, <laughs> we're looking about like two or three a week uh, in, in Chicago. Uh, on the commercial triple net stuff, we're seeing a lot more though. That's, uh, it's, it's funny that Arthur asked because we've been uh, doing some stuff together on these uh, larger commercial triple net stuff. Uh, you can attest to that. Um, Ivan asks, how can we reach you for more questions? How do people contact you, Tony? Uh, Sure. Um, you can you can definitely uh, I'll, I'll put up my contact information letter later. But um, the one thing that you know I think you know Nelson, I really appreciate you know what you're bringing to the community. So and I think you know there's a lot of people who are interested in learning about multifamily. So and I so what I want to do is to have like a apartment 101, 102 series where I talk about different aspects of apartments. Um, and, you know, try to share as much as I can. So you guys don't have to pay that $25,000 fee. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. I can share that. <laughs> so um, that's why I would, the best way to reach me is probably come to one of the meetups or you can, you know, message me on meetup. Um, or, you know, you can probably find me on Facebook and just message me there. So, um, but I'll do my best to, you know, show everybody how to get into commercial. Um, it's not hard. Um, I was able to do it while holding a W-2 job. So I'm sure anybody can. <laughs> it's really the hard part. I feel like is there's just this artificial barrier for people letting you in, not like, not like the difficulty in learning, right? It feels like there's like, ah, well, we don't want to waste our time with a new person. So you really need somebody to like, kind of, um, kick the door down for you more than it is like you yeah. learning because you can learn all you want they people still won't take you seriously that won't mean much right so that's amazing yeah. part i think in the commercial at least and and you know so i think that barrier is very artificial and i you know so in other video podcasts that you did nelson i think you know you also show that how is it it's very possible for you to get into commercial without having to go through the old boys club right um and but the thing is you know, my motto has always been, if you don't have experience, perfectly fine. Partner with somebody that that does, right? That's how I got started. 
I partnered, you know, how I acquired my first deal was uh, I partnered with that Cantonese couple from Hong Kong that I mentioned, right? So they brought their credibility. They brought their ability to provide backup equity in case I wasn't able to raise it all on my own, right? They brought, you know, lender trust, right? Broker trust. So, That's and we also, yeah, so yeah. So, and we also won because the broker wanted to have the ability to, to sell one of the properties and then my partner's portfolio, right? So, um, you know, tag along with somebody, right? And, you know, you, you know, we all share in the profit together, but it's a longer partnership. So as long as you can provide some kind of value add, um, there will be people that will be more than happy to work with you. Yeah, um, definitely see that as a team sport and commercial more so than in single yeah. family. Um, okay, Annie said a lot of tech use here. What advice do you have for people who are new to underwriting? Um, or, you know, like uh, in the commercial side, what do you usually try to do to be conservative with your underwriting? Right. So um, underwriting is really just one big spreadsheet a lot of times, right? Um, so uh, techies will actually feel right at home. <laughs> I was, I mean, so I'm, I'm, I love numbers. I'm sensitive to numbers. So um, to me, I actually enjoy working on the spreadsheet. Maybe, maybe I should have been an accountant. I don't know. But, um, but anyways, um, you know, so when you look at deals, um, there's a few things that you want to be conservative on. So for example, like the annual growth, right? You'll see, you'll see people underwriting for annual growth of like 7% or 8% a year, which is just ridiculous. Um, I usually underwrite two to 3%. Um, there are, and then you also have to assume a certain level of expense. Um, so I usually assume about 50 to 52% of expenses, you know, when I'm underwriting. Um, a lot of people will start underwriting towards 45 to 40. Um, that may be true depending on how new the property is, but usually 50% or above to be safe, right? Um, other thing is like, uh, you know, you have to assume a certain amount of vacancy and um, loss, you know, you're not able to charge market rent, right? That's called economic vacancy. So some people will write down, oh, I only expect to have 7% or 5% economic vacancy. I'm more conservative. I usually underwrite to like about 10% or sometimes 12% economic vacancy. So, um, and people that invest with me trust me uh, because I'm pretty conservative and they, whatever number I put out, it's gonna look lower than other people, you know, but um, they know I can hit it. Yeah, um, we actually, uh, yeah, our expense ratio in Chicago, at least what we've been doing in Chicago is pretty low. We do around 45, mainly because um, we spend about 30 grand a unit on the rehab. We got it and everything's new. Yeah, <laughs> we, it's all new, no maintenance issues. So that's kind of why we can get away with it. But yeah, most of the time I see 45, 55% is uh, what most apartments run at. Um, on the older apartments, we see a lot of 55% in Chicago because they're all like 100 year old buildings. And so. Um, yeah, I, I do a lot of underwriting on them. So I'm like, yeah, this, I'm like, whenever it goes below 50 and it's like a hundred years old, with no renovation in between, I'm like, <laughs> I question it. So, um, okay. Let's see. Uh, Annie asked, okay. So if there's somebody who doesn't know how to underwrite, what can they help with or do to bring value to these projects? Um, I guess learn to underwrite is one, but, uh, what, what other way do you see, uh, them being helpful to, uh, larger syndicators, Tony. Yeah, so um, the best way is to underwrite deals is to look at deals and, um, you know, basically, I, I, I can, I guess I can hold a class on how to underwrite deals, how, you know, how to come up with your own templates on these things. And <clears throat> I can probably give you some sample deals that are not using exactly real numbers. Um, and you can practice how to underwrite deals using those, right? Um, and, you know, I can, I can then share with you my underwriting and see how, where, where the differences are, right? Because um, everybody will have different assumptions and uh, everybody will underwrite deals a little bit differently. Um, so, but, you know, as long as you understand the basics of how, you know, which knob gets turned, which are the most important values to look at. Um, it's a whole, it's, it's a new science in its own, like learning about the cap rates, about the reversion cap, about, you know, what are the typical values for 
uh, insurance per door, those kind of stuff. So um, I think it's it's yeah, it's super helpful. And you know, when you want to be accurate, it takes time, um, and that's where you can bring a lot of value add to uh, syndicators. Reversion cap uh, is your exit cap rate for everyone curious. Uh, when you sell it, usually you want to go like a higher cap rate than the one you entered. Um, okay, so quick question. Has the eviction moratorium changed your view on multifamily? No, it hasn't. <laughs> so I hate to say it, but I've been evicting people throughout COVID uh, without any issues. So, um, Texas. so for Texas and... Um, the main thing is you just, you know, uh, it sounds bad, but um, you just have to really read the, what, what the law is actually about, right? So there's all these people that file CDC declarations, but in there, there's a lot of stipulations where you have to make a reasonable effort to pay your rent, right? So if this guy hasn't paid any rent for three months, guess what? Your CDC declaration is invalid, okay? And, you know, you have to kind of... Um, uh, you have to declare under perjury that you are not receiving any additional aid and all that kind of stuff. So we were actually able to, uh, so we were actually very aggressive in the beginning when people try to file CDC declarations. We challenged every single one of them. Um, and um, so, and got a lot of them invalidated because they couldn't provide proof. Uh, and word gets around, neighbors talk to neighbors, so um, very quickly, they know that, hey, you know, if I file this, it's going to be a lot of work for me to prove it. So, um, you know, so they, in the end, I think we got maybe four CDC declarations when it started. And then after that, nobody filed anymore because they knew that uh, it wouldn't stand up. So we, we, we were still evicting people and um, it, it never really stopped us. So when the eviction memorandum originally ended on in September of last year, we won 90% of our uh, evictions. So, yeah. All right. Um, how do you learn about a local market like Dallas uh, when you live in California? So you know how to buy correctly. Do you have any tips? Yeah. yeah so um, believe it or not, there's actually quite many people who invest in Dallas in California. So um, I go to meetups a lot in the Bay Area. So um, anywhere in the country, um, there's always going to be meetups in your area. And it's good to check them out, right? There's people doing flips. There's people doing short-term rentals. There's people <clears throat> doing notes. Or in California, there's people doing marijuana, right? So anything you want to invest in, there's something to learn. So <clears throat> You can get experience from people who have already invested in the area you're interested in. Um, the other thing is in every major metro, there's usually a multifamily conference being held. So I highly encourage you to attend those, get to know the syndicators, get to know what the market is like. So, you know, like Nelson said, the real estate guys, um, they have a pretty popular um, podcast. They're holding one next, next month or this month in Dallas, right? So there's also the Old Capital Conference for multifamily um, that's more national. And when you get into the big leagues, there's the there's a NNHC that you know is either on the East Coast or West Coast. So go to as much of these conferences as you can um, and you'll be able to learn about it. Yeah, I'm trying to get my uh, the company I'm consulting for Brookfield to sponsor the <laughs> ticket for me to go to MNHC. So <laughs> big boy ones are really expensive. Like right now I'm throwing a few hundred dollars for tickets, but like those bigger ones are really pricey, especially at the corporate level. So, um, okay. Uh, so when, let's see, uh, do you have a Facebook group? Um, uh, how do we reach out? Uh, Arthur is saying he was nine years in the tech and just breaking into commercial. He wants to connect. So, uh, if, I think he said, Arthur, he has a meetup. So probably meeting him in person might be easiest, but I think Arthur might still be remote at the moment. So it might be best to try to DM uh, Tony Lynn directly. He's on Facebook, he's in the group. <laughs> so, um, okay. Yeah, I'm a boomer that's still using Facebook. So, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, Facebook DM me is probably easiest. Um, I do have a Facebook group, but I started that mainly for uh, Mandarin Chinese speakers who didn't really understand multifamily on the web so well. 
Um, and None then, of us can read it. So yeah, all those hey, ABCs. Do you, do you read Mandarin? No, all those ABCs oh. cannot read it. That's what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> Google, yeah. Google Translate. Facebook translates now. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So um, so and then Meetup is probably uh, a, a really good place. But if you want to get in touch with me, you know, I'll uh, Facebook message me. Um, that's really that's really easy. Good. Well, Arthur says he can read Chinese. So he was one of those ABCs where their parents <laughs> forced him to take take Chinese schools. You know, <laughs> <laughs> kind of like what I do with my daughter. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. Um, with that, I think we're going to come to a close because we're getting to that eight o'clock mark in CST time, at least. Um, Annie, do you have any follow-ups uh, for things coming up on SARE that you have announcements for? Absolutely. So this coming week, we have a really big week for meetups. Um, we're going to be meeting in four different cities. So Tuesday is going to be in LA, Wednesday, Las Vegas, Thursday is South San Francisco, and Saturday we have a new location for Dallas, Fort Worth. So if you guys are in any of these locations, come check us out. The Thursday one in San Francisco is going to be a really fun and big one. We have our, our Texas team flying out into San Francisco again. So yay. If you guys missed um, our SARECON event, we have um, David Cito from Houston and Christine Chow that's going to be coming in from Austin. And then um, the big announcement is about our Texas field trip, which is scheduled on November 5th and November 12th. I have started collecting people's flights. So far, we have over, I think, like 18 people confirmed that are coming. And we're going to be going to Houston and then Austin or New California, according yeah, to Chris Town, my buddy it. over here, Dallas. Yeah. Oh, no. So we get to see the almighty Chris Tao in Austin. So come on and fly out and meet with us. If you do have your flights, please let me know if you need Airbnb and rental cars. We do have like, I think three or four Airbnbs and five cars already booked up. So spots are filling up, come on out and meet a fellow investors. We'll be checking out um, different types of properties including commercial real estate so, um, and we're going to have a lot of fun games and activity planned out. So if you are coming, you know, add yourself to the event and let it. All right. Yeah, next Aircon is going to be a lot more commercial from uh, the, the, the looks of it. Oh, you got any last comments, Chris? I see you uh, motioning. Yeah. So I was going to put a little extra plug. I'm going to try to set up a tour for multifamily. So if you guys come to Austin, I'll... Hopefully we'll be able to see one or two multifamily and you can see how things are getting done at the commercial side. Sounds Yay, good. love you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah, well, that, um, if, you guys, if you guys come to Dallas, I can also, uh, you know, show you the properties there as well. You flying in? That's Coming please. in, Tony, in the town? Yeah. Okay. Really? Go, we will be in there for two we're days. We're going to be in Dallas. Yeah. Two days, yeah. So... <laughs> I'm always there every month. So that's like my second home. <laughs> let's, let's try to get up then. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, that's kind of it for the meeting. Uh, have a good rest of your weekend. Thank, thank you. you. All right. See you guys in two weeks. Bye-bye. Thank you.